Hello, Royal History Geeks. Good evening. I say good evening. It's the evening when I'm making this. I don't know if it's the evening when you're watching. And in one sense, that's none of my business. Anyway, this video is exploring the very interesting, in my view, question of what Margaret Beaufort, Lady Margaret Beaufort's relationship was like with her first proper husband, Edmund Tudor, the Earl of Richmond, and of course, along with her, the, the co-founder of the Royal Tudor dynasty. Um, one thing I think is really important to say about all of these questions around Margaret Beaufort or any historical character and their um, relationship with anybody is fundamentally those are secrets, the secrets of their heart that they, they have taken with them to their grave. And we can never truly know. And in the cases of, of figures like Lady Margaret, um, the records are fragmented and we've got quite little to go on. Uh, and we need to bear that in mind. We need to be mindful um, of that. We need to be cautious about the theories that we construct. But nonetheless, there are things that we can look at and we can make some reasonable assumptions that we can discuss together and dialogue about. So many of you will be aware that uh, Margaret Beaufort was married to Edmund Tudor, who was the half-brother of the king, Henry VI, when she was just 12 years old. She was originally given, given to him, if you like, as, 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 a, as a ward and potential really future bride back when she was nine years old, probably because she was a wealthy heiress. She had a, she had a fortune of about a £1,000 a year, which by anybody's standards was, was rich, but for a, for a young girl to have that money was, was really quite, quite outstanding. Um, Henry VI uh, loved his half-brothers, but they weren't royal. They were from his mother's side, but not his, his father's side. They were born in questionable circumstances. He wanted to do all that he could to advance them, so he'd made Edmund, the Earl of Richmond, and, and the younger brother, Jasper, the Earl of Pembroke, but he didn't automatically have huge amounts of land at his disposal that he was able to give to them. Doing that was problematic, even for a king. They had to be careful with, with patronage. Um, however, if he married Lady Margaret Beaufort, who was his cousin, his second cousin, um, a descendant of, of the Duke of Lancaster, to Henry Tudor, he would, of course, have access to all of her lands, uh, to all her property um, for life, um, if, if, if he was able to father a child with her. Um, and then his children, those descendants, would go on to in inherit that, that fortune. And it's a really good proposition. And that's almost definitely why Henry VI chooses to marry his cousin to his half-brother. It's for the advancement of his half-brother that he chooses to do it, probably, as far as we can best work out. Henry, um, not sorry, not Henry Tudor, um, that's the son. Edmund Tudor, Edmund of Richmond, it seems, was very mindful of the fact that he needed to father a son uh, or a child by Lady Margaret in order to have that life claim on her estates. And it seems that he sets to business straight away in doing that. The marriage is consummated when she is just 12 years of age. Now, to us, that sounds horrific. And actually, even to a contemporary, it sounded pretty horrific as well. Yes, people were married young, but they generally didn't consummate marriages until the girl had reached the age of 14. It wasn't universally the case, but the fact that Margaret was small of stature meant that people really would have expected her to wait. And many people probably thought that Edmund had acted unfairly in subjecting his wife to be embedded at such a young age. Of course, many of us know what happened then. She went on to have a son by him, but he had died. Edmund had died at this point. She gave birth to her son, Henry VII, as a 13-year-old widow, and it would seem that that event scarred her emotionally and tragically for the rest of her life. We know that when her own granddaughter and namesake, Margaret, the, the, the daughter, the eldest daughter of, of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, was, was being proposed a marriage to the French king, Margaret intervened and said she must not be sent to Scotland until she is older because he will not wait and he will not spare her and he will cause her harm. She is reflecting on her own experiences which have clearly scarred her emotionally and psychologically. 
that gives us a pretty big hint as to what she may have thought of Edmund Tudor. He wasn't a man she would have known particularly well. He, she wouldn't really have known him before they got married, and they weren't actually together for very long before he went and died of the plague. So one of the memories we know, and when she would have looked back on that time, she would have been reminded of the trauma that she went through. That said, that's not the full picture either. And although the events um, of, of a 12-year-old girl of her size and stature being bedded at such a young and fragile time in her life were shocking to contemporaries, we still need to be very clear that we're not just transposing a 21st century mindset onto somebody from the 15th century, which is obviously the mistake that a lot of people do make. There are other indications that she looked upon her marriage to Edmund Tudor more fondly than we might suppose. She, of course, wanted to be buried with him. She referred to her herself for the rest of her life as the Countess of Richmond, the title she'd acquired on that marriage, which was standard. That's that's what you did in those days. Even if you remarried, you tended to stick with the highest title that, that you could. So we shouldn't read too much into that. But nonetheless, she did do that. And she would often tell a story in later life of how she was given the choice of whether or not she wanted to marry Edmund Tudor. She sought spiritual advice and counsel for it. She felt she was told to to marry to marry Edmund. And she told that story affectionately to people that would listen when she was in a greater degree of prominence later in her life. It's quite possible that you could explain that story and indeed her general um, revering of Edmund's name by wanting to put some divine providence around their match and therefore around the, the springing forth of Henry Tudor and the Tudor royal dynasty. It's also possible, uh, well, and, and, and perhaps we shouldn't over speculate here, but maybe um, what happened to Margaret was so traumatic that she, um, she needed a way of justifying it. She needed a way of, of rationalizing to herself that it had to happen, that it was meant to be. And however hard it was for her, however painful it was for her, it had at least been God's will. And by the end of her life, she could see that great benefit had come from what happened. All of that would have affected how she remembered uh, Edmund Tudor, Edmund of Richmond. What she felt in the depth of her heart, only she knows, and perhaps even she didn't allow herself to feel and acknowledge that fully.